It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mark Kirshner, Chair of the Department of Systems Biology at Harvard Medical School, and he'll be talking about reverse engineering of biological circuits underlying aging and development. Well, I'm going to, um, voice hold out. I'm going to, uh, talk really about a, a new model system for studying aging. Um, and I should say two things about it. One, uh, one is that uh, model systems uh, have been extremely important and it's often the very peculiar properties uh, which, uh, uh, which, which are the most important. Uh, so if you think about Drosophila, a very unusual organism, Drosophila, yeast, which is a peculiar organism in many ways, have been useful in many, many systems, um, and, uh, but, uh, but you can't really predict these things. In the cell cycle, for example, Drosophila ultimately played a role, but was not particularly useful. In the beginning, um, the frog, which, and, uh, and yeast uh, opened up that problem, so you're not absolutely guaranteed just to have a new, a new system that's gonna really do what you expect. Um, I remember again in the cell cycle, um, Pfizerum, a type of uh, slime mold, uh, was supposed to be wonderful because it, it was so synchronous, but it, it didn't contribute much to our understanding of the cell cycle. So I warn you that not everything works out. Um, I should also say that aging uh, is an interesting problem to me in, in, in uh, not just because uh, I, not, not because, in fact, I want to live forever or anything like that, but because um, when you look at the cause of the diseases, the main diseases that uh, confront us, like uh, heart disease and cancer, even infectious disease, um, there's uh, usually the largest component is the aging process, which we don't understand. Lifespan is related to aging, but I'm actually more interested in the question of what is the nature of aging. So um, the strategy we're going to use <coughs> is based on the use of drugs uh, to perturb a very complex physiology in, in a system. But our goal is not drugs. It's, it's a, the process by which we're going to get to some understanding of the biology. And the idea is to develop a quantitative measure of the aging phenotype on very many levels, functional, behavioral, cellular, molecular levels, um, not just the ones that are easy for us to measure, like the transcriptome is today, but ones that are more difficult, such as the proteome. Uh, the goal is to make small pharmacological perturbations and quantitatively measure the phenotypic responses, and this is as measured in these uh, measures of aging. And then to use uh, reverse engineering to try to extract from these small perturbations and their effects, what are the principal drivers of the aging process, even if we don't understand their mechanism. And from that, to begin to get an idea of what's the important features and important circuits um, to, uh, that, are, that are controlling aging. Uh, and, uh, and maybe uh, in some methods that uh, Lam Peshkin who's an audience in, uh, in our lab um, developed earlier, to actually get at the uh, specific molecular circuits through reverse engineering approaches. So uh, let's see, this is not exactly where I thought I'd be, but I can start here. Um, <clears throat> so we picked an animal called Daphnia. Uh, it's not on the tip of everybody's tongue when they talk about molecular biology these days. Um, but it, if you remember in elementary school, you might remember this water flea, which is about, um, and I'll show a picture over here, that uh, is about, uh, see how do I get this thing to do the right thing here? I can do it over here. Um, okay, so there's the organism. It's about uh, two millimeters in size. It's rather transparent. Um, it has a life expectancy, this bigger species, of about 30 days. It's a parthenogenic 
diploid, which means we can make an infinite population forever and ever, which has exactly the same genetic composition. Since genetics is a component of this process, we would like to eliminate it. Um, it's, uh, it, it makes a large number of offspring. It's, uh, as I'll point out, it's very permeable to drugs, which is not something easy to uh, find. Uh, it can be cultivated in very small volumes of water, 10 cc's per animal. It has a heart, as shown here, that beats. And when it's been examined in, uh, uh, in response to cardiotoxic drugs, it's very similar in its uh, response to the human heart. Uh, here we see uh, the circulation, not in, of, in vessels, but of small cells. Uh, the discovery of these cells in this organism by Metchnikoff was the discovery of the immune system, and specifically the innate immune system for which he received the Nobel Prize. It has an, an, a compound eye connected to a brain, and uh, its uh, a complete genome is available. So, uh, there's a lot of things that uh, it's recommended. <clears throat> now, the, um, it has a lot of things not to recommend it. So uh, I, don't want to come to, I do want to come to that. Um, in some sense, uh, many systems we're looking at are ones which can do many different things. And this is always uh, the, the, the parable of the fox and uh, the hedgehog. The fox knows how to do many different things. The hedgehog only knows how to round up in a ball, but it seems to be effective for hedgehogs. And, uh, and so uh, in this case, you could say the mouse is our fox and Daphnia is our hedgehog. And it's really a um, key feature, which I think is unparalleled, is the ability to test small drugs on it, small molecules on it. Because, you know, even if you uh, it's very hard to, to, to actually um, add drugs to animals. I mean, you can't inject the mouse every day. That's illegal. Uh, you can't, uh, you can put fish into a tank, in which case you have liters of water, and a drug screen with liters of drugs it would be quite expensive here. It's, uh, it's uh, only about 10 cc's of water. So um, there aren't so many things that are so well adapted to drug screening. So as I mentioned, the good news is it's easy to culture, it's permeable, it's short-lived, it's aquatic, which means drug delivery, it's swallowing the drug all the time, all the time. Um, it's completely isogenic. Uh, it has physiologies and tissues very similar to human. It has behavior. Uh, all, all these things vary with age, and we're beginning to understand that. Um, the bad features are Long-term husbandry hasn't been worked out, so we have to do that. Molecular analysis, histopathology, behavior studies linked to lifespan, these have to be worked out from scratch. Um, it also currently lacks a large community of people um, developing molecular cellular uh, approaches. I listened very carefully for the first days of uh, talks, and no one mentioned Daphnia, which is an indication of its tremendous impact on the modern world. However, uh, it, does, uh, it is very good for what we want to use it for. So I want to give you, uh, in a couple of minutes, the um, examples of some progress. We have more than this, but that just give you a, f a flavor of what we're to bring to this. And one of them is, has to do with, um, with developing good husbandry and our first sort of experiments with that. Uh, we go back. So uh, <clears throat> we want, normally we, we uh, have these little bottles and every uh, day or so we, uh, we change the water and add the food. So we had to develop a, a method for continuous culture. The other continuous uh, culture problem is they're constantly having babies. And the babies grow up and uh, you, they contaminate, obviously they confuse the, the issue. So we have an automatic way of filtering out the babies and counting them as well. So that's part of the phenotype is fecundity. And this seems to work quite well over the lifespan of the animal. And uh, we have to still test its complete stability. But to give you an idea, here's a, um, a Gompertz curve, which is a mortality curve. 
uh, plot of that book, Kale Here for Humans, and uh, and the um, and also plans for da for one experiment with daftium that we did, and they're pretty similar in their shape. They they um, they had issue this exponential uh, increase in uh, more uh, more mortality with age. Um, We've done one experiment which was a bit of a surprise. Uh, we decided to ask <clears throat> whether um, old mothers uh, produce offspring identical to young mothers. And so we uh, experiment which we call the daughter of old mother experiment, or the doom experiment, um, uh, led to some interesting results here. That, um, that if you look at young mothers or random age mothers or old mothers, the older the mother, the larger the percentage of males that are produced. Males are produced in the population, but of course, we're getting the female diploids to carry them on, but uh, we can count the number of males very easily. And um, in addition to that, the longevity, longevity of progeny from older mothers is greater than the, uh, than the longevity of progeny from younger mothers. And, um, <coughs> And this gets, I think, will get down to issues, uh, both the, the, the sex ratio and the um, longevity issues uh, may get down to issues about mitochondrial damage uh, and also uh, with age change in metabolism such as lipid dep deposition. So I think uh, even though this is a phenomenological experiment, it uh, gives us something to think about here. Um, now, what we really want to do is, uh, I mean, this is uh, obviously a metazoan organism with lots of tissues. It has a liver and a gut. It has a, a nervous system. It has a vascular system. Uh, it has a kidney type system. Um, so it has all these tissues. And uh, the tissues are different. And uh, we certainly can grind up the animal and do um, um, transcriptomics or proteomics. Uh, but we want to be able to um, examine the um, tissues themselves and uh, not just get qualitative information, but get quantitative information about the tissues. This is a general problem. It's not just true for Daphnia. And we were, in fact, working in parallel on this problem for, um, uh, for a, uh, a while. And, uh, and this is really the work <coughs> of um, Sunin O. Oh, uh, who I don't think is listed on the last slide because she's not part of the Daphne group, but she developed this and it's now part of our uh, standard approach here, or we're developing part of the standard approach. And um, this is a, a new microscope, which is we call NORI for normalized Raman imaging. It's a Raman microscope, and the key point is its normalization. So it allows us to get exquisitely quantitative information about mass density, lipid mass density. Uh, it allows us to virtually eliminate scattering problems. And because it's a normalized method, it's not like histology where you do it once and you do it the next time and it looks similar, but it's not quite the same. It'll be absolutely identical from one time to another, which means it's identical from one animal to another, for, regardless of age. So we can use this as, we can parameterize this useful, usefully for, um, I think, for uh, aging studies. Um, so the microscope is complicated. It involves three um, wavelengths. One that interrogates lipids. It's the methylene group. The Raman, as, you, as many of you know, uh, is a, a spectral method. So we can dial in different chemical entities. We dial in the, the uh, methylene group of the fatty acid chain. We dial in the methyl group that's found on light on the, Valine and uh, leucine other amino acids, which is specific to the protein, and we dial in water, uh, and that is the uh, um, the actual key to this normalization, because we can decompose the signal completely separately into water, lipid, and protein by spectral decomposition, and when we add those things up, we essentially have the mass of the cell. So if every pixel is divided by the sum of these things, that is the total light that is at that pixel. And this miraculously cracks completely for scattering. And we can go as much as uh, 
uh, 300 microns into tissue and reconstruct cells without any scattering. And I could show you that I don't have time here, but I'll give you an example of a few images. And these images uh, now are given, uh, can be read out in terms of the actual protein concentration. Uh, this is, and this, these are in rat, rat uh, tissues. Um, and uh, let's see where this thing is here. Uh, and uh, on the left, you can see the, the, uh, the kidney glomeruli. And we get lipids and protein here. And um, for Kinji cells in the uh, cerebellum, uh, if you look closely, they come in two, in two flavors differing in, in mass density. And uh, these, uh, these were looked at in living cells. This is, the staining here is, is un, these are unstained, unfixed. These are just looking at false color due to the, the, um, the chemical decomposition of this, this data. Uh, and, and you can get this kind of information. So we can now look at aging animals in different tissues and not only talk about the distribution of things, but the complexity, quantitative amount of, of, the, of these kinds of things. Uh, this is was one striking thing. Here we're looking only at the lipid signal, so not to confuse you, but uh, this is a mo mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, and the, the green is lipid. And uh, if I showed you the protein within those little uh, areas would be um, uh, amyloid plaques, not all of which are surrounded with, by these massive lipid accumulation. And so if you could see lipid typically in a microscope, that would be so much more obviously a, a measure of, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and you can see other things too. You can see the tau tangles as well in the, in the cells because they we're not showing protein. So that's the kind of thing we're gonna look for. This is not Daphnia, but I'll just show you that. This is Daphnia, but I think I'll just say that we're beginning to collect information. We don't really have it yet. And finally, the plans for the future. Um, I definitely believe that the future lies ahead, so that's my plan. Uh, but um, uh, really to complete the development of the proteomic, phosphoproteomic, lipidomic analyses of Daphne aging. I should say one more thing here, that probably the strongest phenotype of aging is variation itself. And uh, if you're looking at organisms like the mouse, you're not going to look at several hundred samples at each age. And so you'll, I'm not saying you get wrong information, you maybe luck out and found that the absolute average mouse, but what you won't measure then is also the variation of that, uh, of that variation with age. And here with having an animal, we can look at hundreds, even thousands of animals. Uh, we can begin to collect that kind of information which is not generally available in aging samples. Um, uh, we want to look at a, a systematic drug screens and, uh, where we measure lifespan, but also behavioral, physiological, and cellular features. Um, we also want to express the 150 kinases in Daphne, which is about a, about a fourth of uh, the third or fourth of uh, what we have in human. And um, that will allow us to do other kinds of, of machine learning approaches. We want to continue the histopathological analysis and support that with EM. Um, we also want to do some parallel, well, we are beginning to do some parallel imaging in rat and mouse aging. And, um, uh, and begin modeling these things. So that's kind of the goal, it's pretty ambitious. And uh, I'm not making any predictions here, but uh, just have a lot of positive energy for it. The positive energy comes, of course, from the people who are providing the positive energy. Uh, and, uh, and they're listed up here. And I, I mentioned Leon, who's in the audience, if you could talk to him, who um, started this project with me. So thank you. <laughs>